given the state of education policy today, the degree to which it has has changed under the Obama administration with race to the top and the various things that were done, how much damage can be done by the Federal Department of Education with somebody like Betsy DeVos running it? I think that uh, the damage can be very considerable. Uh, a state like California might be able to shield itself by saying no, uh, because she's obviously going to devolve a lot of power to states. But in the meanwhile, uh, most of the states in this country are controlled by Republicans who are as hard right as she is. And so we may see uh, half the country moving towards uh, disestablishing public education and replacing it with vouchers for religious schools. And frankly, there, there are not enough religious schools in the whole country to accommodate all of the uh, children who would get vouchers under under the proposal that Donald Trump has made. So we would see uh, fly-by-nights uh, operating in church basements uh, and fly-by-night charters that pop up overnight. Uh, the state of Michigan has uh, many charters, hundreds of charters, and the charters in Michigan do worse than the regular public schools. Uh, Detroit, which is overrun with charters, and overrun, by the way, with for-profit charters. I, I don't think that California has – no, California does have some for-profit charters. But um, Michigan – 80% of the charters in Michigan are for-profit. Uh, so it's a terrible, unregulated uh, sector. And the Detroit Free Press ran a, a, a year-long investigation in which they said the charter industry in Michigan – spends a billion dollars a year of taxpayer money with no accountability, and it gets worse results in the public schools. So I think that if we take Betsy DeVos's example of Michigan, we're talking about the, the, the dumbing down of American education uh, and the ruination of good public schools. What does this mean for things like Common Core and some of these local funding formulas that have been put in place over the past several years? Well, I, I don't think that she will have much effect on Common Core. Donald Trump used that as an applause line when he was running for office, that it's a disaster, he'll get rid of it. Uh, actually, Common Core is, once it was created, and, and it was shoved into the states by Arne Duncan, because Arne Duncan said, I have a $5 million pot of discretionary money here, and if you want to be eligible to apply, you have to adopt the Common Core. So something like 45 states went along and adopted the Common Core in hopes of getting a part of that $5 billion. Uh, only 18 states got uh, the, the, the money he was offering, uh, but then 45 were stuck with the Common Core. Now, these states can get rid of the Common Core if they want to. It's not really a federal issue anymore. And the the education uh, department, uh, the person who's in charge of it, can't say to states, don't use the Common Core because uh, he or she, and she in this case, doesn't have that authority. Uh, as it happens, Betsy DeVos is a supporter of the Common Core. And I've seen several names, uh, like Hannah Scandera, who's now the chief education officer in New Mexico, who is an avid supporter of the Common Core. So every name that's been proposed for uh, the Trump administration's Department of Education is a huge supporter of Common Core. So this is just another one of Trump's lies. Talk a little bit about funding and the impact that it can have on states that, that might resist some of the changes, states like California, as you mentioned before, that might resist some of the changes trying to be made. The, the nature of the... Um, what what they want to do with funding is Donald Trump said during the campaign that he would take $20 billion of existing federal funding and offer it to the states as uh, you can do with this money what you wish, uh, but it'll be targeted for vouchers or, char or charters or any other use you want to make, cyber schooling. Uh, so many states will take this money and say, oh, great, instead of spending it on poor kids, uh, we'll spend it on opening up more charters and offering vouchers. Um, I think that if California doesn't want to do that, it won't have to do it. You can continue your present funding formula. But what he's what he's trying to do is to take existing federal funding that has a specific purpose, one, to help poor kids and to go directly to those schools where they're enrolled. And two, I believe he'll also be dipping into money for special education and kids with disabilities. 
because he's got he's didn't say he was going to spend new money on education so he's t- those are the two pots of money that he can raise and say this is money going to the states and it's going to be turned into money to be used for charter charters or vouchers and presumably they might even include public schools as one of the choices you're allowed to make so if if a state like california says we don't want what you're offering uh that money could be used for more charter schools. I mean, California already has more charter schools than any other state. Uh, and frankly, I, I think the state has too many charter schools and not, as in every state, not enough supervision. I spoke with your, uh, head of the State Department of Education, Tom Turlickson, and I asked him, what kind of supervision are you able to provide? And he said, we, we simply don't have the staff to, uh, supervise charters. So charters are basically, uh, they take the money and, and nobody oversees them. And the only way that scandals are revealed is when there's a whistleblower. Talk a little bit about the impact, the overall impact you see this having in terms of accountability. You know, we've talked for so long in this country about testing, about accountability, about measurement, about metrics in education. This is debate's been going on for a long time. How do you see that playing out within the context of all that we've been talking about? Well, just before the election, Congress passed a new law to replace No Child Left Behind called the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, I mean, I have a big problem with this whole idea that this federal government is in charge of accountability because they're very distant from the schools and they frankly don't know what they're talking about. So they're always looking for some kind of a, a, a measurement tool and they fall back on what, what's available, which is standardized tests. Uh, I have had a lot of experience uh, overseeing standardized testing because I was for seven years on the uh, what's called the National Assessment Governing Board. Now, that's a federal uh, entity that cre- that o- supervises uh, the NAEP. NAEP is the national test that's given every two years. So I've, I've had a lot of familiarity with testing, and I came to feel very dubious about the value of these tests when they're used for anything other than sampling. Uh, the v- virtue of the NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, is that it's given every two years and reading it in math, and it's like it's like a dipstick. You you don't check your you don't use your dipstick every single day in your car unless it's a in terrible trouble. <laughs> but you you periodically, if if dipsticks even exist anymore, and I'm not not even sure about that, but you periodically do a sampling to see how things are going. I think that uh, what makes sense is to stop testing every child every year. There's no other country in the world that does this. Uh, but Congress uh, could not give up on the No Child Left Behind idea of testing every child every year. And so the new law, uh, the Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, will mean every child will be tested every year from grades three through eight in reading and in math. And then the states are required to identify their lowest 5% of schools and to take some kind of dramatic action. Now, all of this is still frankly, an extension of No Child Left Behind, which failed miserably. Uh, We've seen uh, not only very little progress over these past 15 years of constant measurement, uh, but the last time that the um, NAEP was given, the National Assessment Test was given, uh, scores actually went flat for the first time in about 20 years. And states were not making progress because all this testing takes away time from instruction. The way that kids learn is if they're taught, not, not, they don't learn because they're tested, they learn because they're taught. And I would like to see less testing and more teaching. Uh, but that's not what federal law says. Federal law says you will continue the testing. Uh, and all this emphasis on testing and measurement and metrics and data and accountability has produced nothing. Um, And there was a report that just came out yesterday, actually, yesterday afternoon, which I put on my blog this morning, uh, Mathematical Policy Research, which is an independent research agency, was commissioned by the federal government to evaluate one of its big programs, and it's called the School Improvement Grants. This was three and a half billion dollars. We're not talking million, we're talking B billion, three and a half billion dollars to um, for testing, for firing teacher, firing uh, principals, reorganizing schools, punishing schools if they didn't meet the test scores, etc. And um, the study said that the this three and a half billion dollars had zero effect on student achievement, zero. So I think that all of this data-driven testing uh, has no impact other than to destroy the arts, uh, eliminate physical education, 
uh, reduced uh, reduced the teaching of science and history and civics and distort education. Uh, and I, I, I look forward to the day, which won't be coming soon, but someday <laughs> we'll have better leadership in, in Washington that will understand that all of these incentives have been counterproductive, that they were driving people away from the teaching profession. Uh, we're not getting the best people coming in because the best people are leaving uh, because they're sick of being judged by these stupid standardized test scores. And finally, Diane, what should parents be on the lookout for in this kind of environment that we're about to go into? I think that what parents need to do is to go to their schools and say, you know what really matters to me is that our ch my child have adequate time for the arts. I want my child to come to school not to be tested, but to learn to play an instrument, to sing in a chorus, uh, to uh, join a band, uh, to, to paint, to, to do sculpture, to learn to use the computer to do creative things. I think that parents should insist upon all the activities in school that lead to healthy and happy and fulfilled children that give children joy. I mean, I think that what's really crucial is to forget about the test scores and focus on the joy of learning. And everything the federal government doing is doing and has been doing now for 15 or 16 years has been, uh, well, has the effect of squashing the joy of learning. And this is a great country. We have wonderful public schools, despite all the lies you hear in the media. And Support your public schools, support your teachers, and encourage them to give children time to play. Um, read uh, Pazi Salberg's wonderful book, Finnish Lessons, and learn about how Finland became one of the best education systems in the world, not by testing, but by focusing on creativity and the arts and the joy of learning. It really works.